So I'm going to be talking today about some of the, the background to the updates we've been doing to the Australian Resuscitation Council guidelines on hypothermia and cold injuries. There, there's a policy within the ARC to rotate the uh, review of all the guidelines. So as these were a couple of special interest areas for, for mine, I was assigned these to uh, take the lead on. And it's also good that we, we have some SERP life saving representatives on the ARC as well as my ski patrol background. And I was fortunate to get some expert input from uh, the Medical Committee of the International Commission on Alpine Rescue. With the, the guidelines, we, at the start of them, always define this, the scope of practice. So who does the guideline um, apply to in, in terms of our practice capacity? And both the hypothermia and cold injury guidelines are for the pre-hospital or I think in some places it's called out of hospital setting. The guidelines are designed to apply to everyone, whether they're an adult or a child. And the audience is, um, is the people that should use the guideline. So we uh, do apply this to uh, everyone across the whole spectrum, whether whether you're just a, a bystander or someone who's had first aid training or a health professional working in that environment. The, the current hypothermia guideline is, is set out in a, a fairly standard way with an introduction, looking at some of the causes for hypothermia how you recognise it, how you manage it, and then some information about the, the level of evidence and the classes of recommendation. Anyone who's done literature reviews or, or research would be familiar with, with that, that uh, with the emphasis on evidence-based medicine, it's always good to say just how much evidence do you have, whether it's a randomised controlled trial or expert opinion, and then some references and further reading. And I guess one of the special things about both hypothermia and cold injuries is that, as you can imagine, it's, it's not an area where there are a lot of randomised control trials conducted because it would be quite unethical uh, in general to subject people to, to these sort of conditions or injuries. So expert opinion plays a large area in this um, determination of guidelines as opposed to a lot of other areas of medicine. So uh, first of all, we just need to consider what, what is accidental hypothermia and it's uh, exactly that. It's hypothermia which occurs as a result of an um, accident as opposed to therapeutic hypothermia which is used in hospitals and critical care settings where people's body temperature is deliberately lowered. Uh, normally our body temperature is about 37 degrees centigrade. Sorry, I don't know the Fahrenheit equivalent uh, to that. But hypothermia is defined as when the body temperature falls below 35 degrees centigrade. Accidental hypothermia, most people would think of that as occurring in, in cold environments or people falling into very cold water. But it can, can also occur if you have problems with body temperature regulation and uh, many metabolic diseases, for instance, could have an influence there. And uh, it's also a gradual and insidious process. So it's something that creeps up on people rather than them necessarily being immediately aware of it. And uh, the elderly and the very young are particularly susceptible. In terms of uh, looking for high quality evidence to guide us in the review, 
we looked at the European Resuscitation Council guidelines for resuscitation coming out of the 2015 International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Review and Section 4 of that dealt with cardiac arrest in special circumstances, including environmental emergencies. There was also a, a recent paper published on behalf of the International Commission for Mountain Emergency Medicine, which is part of the International Commission on Alpine Rescue, um, looking at the topic of accidental hypothermia. And uh, you, you may have noticed that, that I mentioned earlier that hypothermia is defined as being a body temperature of under 35 degrees uh, centigrade. But in the pre-hospital setting, it's, it's extremely difficult to measure temperature accurately. And in order to, to do so, people will suggest things like using a, a rectal thermometer or an esophageal temperature probe and uh, as, as you can imagine, that, that really wouldn't be practical for, for first aiders or ski patrollers out on the side of a um, blustery hill in the middle of, of winter. So we decided that it was probably uh, better that we didn't ask first aiders to measure temperature. Uh, but then, of course, that, that leaves us with the question of how do we assess the degree of hypothermia? So the, uh, the published resources are, are actually very helpful. The uh, ICAR paper gives us a, um, a four uh, category staging of hypothermia that also has the uh, clinical findings associated with it. And then if we look at the ERC guidelines, they use more or less the same category of um, stagings and it's given a name there as the Swiss staging system and they also add uh, a fifth category which is death due to irreversible um, hypothermia. Now uh, in terms of the review we, we wanted to move from the existing descriptors for mild and moderate to severe hypothermia in the ARC guideline to, to the slimmed down descriptions which are in the ICAR and um, ERC um, staging systems. So you can probably see from what's in front of you on your screen there that uh, there's quite, quite a few things that we would be asking people to remember in order to be able to assess hypothermia in the current guideline. But then if you go to the revised guideline, we decided to try to adopt the paired back descriptors which are in the ICAR and ERC staging systems. So for mild, hypothermia, that's just a requirement that the victim is conscious and shivering. For moderate hypothermia, their consciousness may have uh, started to be clouded, so they might be a bit, bit confused and they might be shivering lightly or perhaps have reached the stage of um, not being able to shiver at all. And for severe hypothermia, the requirement is that the victim is unconscious and if you look for signs of life, such as um, breathing or a pulse that may or may not be present. But it's important to remember with severe hypothermia that even though someone might, might appear to be dead and not have any detectable signs of life, that they still might have um, a very slow, um, small volume pulse and an unrecordable blood pressure. So we shouldn't write them off as um, being dead until we've made an attempt to uh, rewarm them. There, there were a number of reasons to justify using a simplified classification. And just a few of them uh, were to make it simple for, for first aiders. Uh, so if I'm a ski patroller out in the middle of the blizzard um, 
I, I don't uh, really want to be having to hang around for a long time to try to go through a, a long checklist and work out what the level of hypothermia is. And also having a simplified system would make it easier for first aiders to, to remember, which is always good in an emergency situation if we don't have to think too hard about things. Uh, the third was that we were going to free them up from having to take any temperature readings. And, and finally, uh, it was because this was the best expert opinion that, that was available. And uh, with the, the ARC discussions, they're, they're always very robust. There's always a range of, of opinions. And, um, and some, some people were, were very reluctant to let go of the, the detailed descriptors. But uh, once they had a chance to have a look at the ICAR paper and the ERC paper and the reasons for having the simplified staging systems, they were uh, a lot happier with moving to a simplified system. There is also a set of guidelines published by the Wilderness Medical Society, which is a very respected uh, North American organization. And uh, there, are, there are two really good things in the guidelines I'm going to talk about today. There's an algorithm for assessment of um, accidental hypothermia, but also the Wilderness Medical Society guidelines say that it's okay to use clinical judgment if temperature measurement is not available. So that was an additional support that we could use in terms of not expecting first aiders to measure temperature. This, uh, this is the algorithm from the Wilderness Medical Society. As you can see, it's a little bit complicated and it would take a little bit of time to work through that. So we're not going to do that today. But uh, I would just like to mention the point that we did discuss whether an algorithm could be included in the revised guideline. And we thought the Wilderness Medical Society one was very good. But, uh, but of course, it also starts to refer to advanced pre-hospital management. Uh, and we, we thought that that wouldn't really be suitable to include in a first aid guideline. Uh, just excuse me a moment. There are some renovations going on next door. So I think I had better put my earplugs in so that I'm not going to be disturbing you too much. So uh, apologies for, for that. So we did talk about developing a, a simplified algorithm as part of our ongoing review of the guidelines. One of, one of the good things about the ARC is that we do have a very wide range of representatives from all, all areas of um, emergency medicine and uh, resuscitation support. And one of our life-saving representatives suggested that sometimes people aren't actually hypothermic, but they're just feeling cold and uh, they might just need to, for instance, have a warm shower before they go home. And it was good to see that that issue was specifically addressed in the Wilderness Medical Society algorithm, and they identified a number of people who, who might be cold as opposed to being hypothermic or maybe even mildly hypothermic, but still able to recover and go home without needing to go to hospital. So uh, this, this is the relevant section of the Wilderness Medical Society algorithm. At the, the top, we have people with a normal mental status who are still shivering, who are not hypothermic. Um, then the next category down, they're, they're cold stressed, but not hypothermic, and they're still able to care for themselves. 
And finally, uh, with the mild hypothermia, they, uh, they probably need a bit more of a uh, careful clinical assessment, but uh, they still may be able to uh, stay in situ and spend some time recovering and not need to go to hospital. Uh, I won't, won't go through all of this, but it will just be there as a resource in the PDF uh, copy of the slides. But uh, basically, the uh, Wilderness Medical Society are, are recommending that someone who's shivering but able to function well and care for themselves is unlikely to be hypothermic. Uh, but someone who is shivering, becoming incapacitated and not able to care for themselves is likely to be hypothermic. And they, they give the very good advice that if there's any doubt, somebody should be assumed to be hypothermic. Another suggestion from Surf Life Saving was that we should include a section on uh, cold water shock. And uh, the people who do spend a lot of time in the aqueous environment uh, mentioned that it is, is a concern that people can become severely hypothermic very quickly. And as a result of that, they're, they're not able to hold on to flotation objects and uh, they'll simply slip off and, and drown. And I guess if you've watched the uh, the movie Titanic, you, you will have seen this acted out. If we're thinking about the physiological response to cold water immersion, there are basically three three phases. What happens immediately when, when we uh, get into cold water? what happens in the, the short term, and then uh, what happens as time goes by. So in the initial phase, there's, there's a gasp response. You may all have experienced that yourself. It, if you've uh, ended up in cold water for whatever reason, and this, this can cause drowning, uh, people do tend to hyperventilate and um, as they blow off uh, carbon dioxide in excess of uh, normal levels, this can lead to uh, confusion and uh, disorientation, and that can also contribute to, to drowning. And um, there's profound peripheral vasoconstriction. So that means that there's a lot more blood in the central circulation, which can end up increasing cardiac output and um, blood pressure. And uh, not, not uncommon that myocardial ischemia or arrhythmias can occur. In the, the second phase, um, there's conductive heat loss from the body to, to the water, and that results in decreased neuromuscular activity, and people will tend to lose both their their fine and gross motor control, which goes back to the difficulty I mentioned earlier of um, being able to hold on to things, and also, of course, difficulty being being able to uh, swim to keep their head above the water, and that can take less than thirty minutes to occur. And in in the uh, longer term. If you don't have a flotation device, your odds of reaching this, this phase are considerably lowered. And uh, basically what, what happens with hypothermia in, in water um, is similar to what happens on land, but immersion hypothermia will, will occur much more quickly. It's an interesting fact that the um, heat conductivity of water is 25 um, times that of air. and any uh, insulative effects of your clothing are lost in water unless, of course, you, you have a special type of wetsuit or dry suit on. Just a quick refresher about, um, about heat loss. So there, there are five main ways that we can lose heat from the body, and you're, you're probably familiar with those. Rad radiations um, to surrounding uh, colder areas or substances such as the air, conduction where the body is in contact with a colder surface, 
convection of where the body warms the surrounding air, air or water and this, this moves away being replaced by cooler air or water, uh, evaporation and then respiration. And uh, a lot of people too aren't, uh, aren't aware that we lose fluid through respiration as well. So there's, there's a thing called circumrescue collapse, which is where people experience syncope or, or sudden death, uh, particularly with, with water immersion, but not exclusively uh, just before, during or after um, the removal point. And this is often caused by um, extreme hypertension or by the inset of uh, insidious cardiac arrhythmias. The, the key contributing factors um, are, are a little bit complex, but uh, one of the good things that water does is, is provide um, uh, hydrostatic pressure to encourage um, the, the return of um, blood from the veins in the lower legs to, to the heart. And when you remove someone from water, then that removes the benefit of that, that hydrostatic pressure and so you can get pooling of blood in the, the veins, in the lower legs, and decreased venous return to, to the heart. You can also get um, cooled venous blood coming back to the central circulation. And uh, if the heart itself is, is cold, because the um, internal body systems are, are hypothermic, then uh, the heart may have difficulty maintaining cardiac output or undergoing physical exertion. And one, one interesting point is when, when we're in a stressful situation, our sympathetic nervous system, our endogenous adrenaline is all working, working very hard to keep us in that fight or, or flight state. But um, close to rescue, people can start to relax and some people that might be enough to uh, cause a drop in their blood pressure because they no longer have that sympathetic drive and that, that can lead to um, cerebral hypoxia and loss of consciousness which can actually cause them to drown. There, there are really only two key management points. Uh, the first is that you should handle them carefully to avoid precipitating cardiac arrhythmias and uh, ideally they should be transported horizontally. Another point that uh, we wanted to incorporate into the, the guidelines is the, the research and publications which have come, come out over the last five years about intermittent cardiopulmonary resuscitation for severe hypothermia. And this was probably the landmark paper which was published on this, this topic. And uh, several of the lead authors are part of the Medical Commission of, of ICAR and a couple of them were kind enough to provide feedback on our draft guideline. That was uh, Drs. Les Gordon and Peter Paul. There is an algorithm for intermittent CPR. And uh, one of the, the very first things to consider is whether you have a mechanical chest compression device available. Uh, some of you may have seen that in action if you work for uh, an emergency medical service. You may even have one amongst your your equipment. So if you if you do have one, a mechanical chest compression device is is recommended because hypothermic patients can require CPR for extended periods. But if you don't, of course, you should commence manual CPR. But uh, one of the main issues with a lot of people in remote areas is that they need to be taken to an evacuation point and the area that they've collapsed in uh, may, may not be, be very 
conducive to a quick and easy rescue. For instance, uh, up on the, the side of a mountain or someone who's been extricated from an avalanche. So this algorithm considers how to, to manage those uh, casualties. There, there is uh, a discussion of various temperatures and if you have those temperatures, well, well and good, but um, the algorithm fortunately also considers the situation where the temperature is, is unknown. And in that situation, it recommends alternating five minutes of uh, CPR and five minutes without CPR. The uh, description of intermittent CPR in the ERC guidelines is, um, is quite similar and that also allows for the, the possibility that temperature might be unknown. So when we were looking at inserting this into the ARC guideline, we decided to remove the reference to temperature completely, which was consistent with the earlier decision that we shouldn't be expecting first aiders to measure um, temperature in the, the setting of hypothermia and often in a cold and, and remote and inhospitable location. These, these are just um, some summary points about uh, what, I've, what I've just uh, worked you through. And the rule of thumb, if you sum it all up, is that um, five minutes on, five minutes off, but resume continuous CPR as soon as possible. Uh, it was also felt very strongly that we should include some wording in the revised guideline that addressed prevention of hypothermia. And because we do have such a wide range of uh, representatives on, on the council, uh, people collectively thought it would be good to address um, occupational, recreational and sporting settings generally and that, that would include the water sports that some of the representatives are associated with and of course my, my own snow sports uh, setting and um, uh, people going bushwalking. And uh, the uh, representative from the New Zealand Resuscitation Council suggested we should also include some wording about preventing the rescuer from becoming a secondary victim. And of course, uh, a rescuer can quite easily get hypothermic uh, while they're, they're out on the side of a, a mountain trying to rescue someone else. And if, if you come from uh, elsewhere in the world, you may be interested to know that we do have cold alpine environments in both Australia and New Zealand and we do have snow sports industries and a ski patrol in, in both countries but we do have a relatively short uh, winter season. And unfortunately we, we are being affected by, by climate change. It's been, uh, been quite obvious over the past couple of decades that the seasons have been, been getting shorter and the, the level of, of snow um, has been, been less and less predictable than previously. So moving, moving on to um, prevention, it, it always uh, amuses me the quote from Voltaire which dates from 1765, that common sense is not so common and that that is something that certainly uh, applies to preparation for people going out into remote areas and um, cold areas. So prevention is, is the key to uh, trying to stop people from ending up in situations where we need to rescue them um, as being extremely hypothermic. And that will include elements such as um, plan, planning ahead, uh, checking weather forecasts, um, boating forecasts, etc. Being informed about where where you're going and educating other members uh, in your party, making sure you have adequate food and hydration, 
adequate clothing, um, including some redundancy measures, that you, you have a plan for, for shelter if you run into a difficulty, uh, that you, you have a buddy system. You should ideally never go into a remote um, or extreme environment on your own and that you should have some capacity for communicating with or notifying the outside world. The Australian Ski Patrol Association that I'm associated uh, with on the, the medical committee and a volunteer patroller, we have a, um, a special website for SnowSafe, which has a lot of practical information for everyday people for staying safe and warm in the alpine environment. And we've noticed a trend over recent years that we get a lot of uh, day, day trippers who just come up for snow play and they're, they're often people from non-English speaking backgrounds. And so we felt it was especially important to, to try to educate them so that um, just as a basic thing that they, they come up to the snow with the, the right clothing. And the final uh, section that, that I will just, just quickly uh, run through is um, the guideline on, on cold injuries. So first, first of all, cold, cold injuries have a number of uh, categorizations. There's, there's frostbite and frost nip, which are freezing cold injuries. And then with non-freezing cold injuries, there's a trench, trench foot, uh, chillblains and cold urticaria. With uh, frost, frostbite and frost nip, they're usually um, localised areas which are restricted to extremities or areas which have been exposed to the cold. Uh, frost, frostbite uh, can can include both reversible and irreversible elements and frost nip is the first stage of uh, frostbite but uh, it's uh, regarded as being reversible with uh, passive rewarming and trench trench foot is um, a condition which develops when the extremities are exposed for long periods uh, to temperatures just above freezing. So if you think of, of um, uh, for instance, a soldier who's wearing wet boots and socks and is, uh, is out, out somewhere uh, without any opportunity to, to dry them out and might end up having wet feet for several days. And historically, it's the type of thing that uh, can bring down an army for instance, with uh, Napoleon's disastrous campaign to um, invade Russia in 1812. Chillblains are an inflammatory condition, so often uh, people will get uh, itchiness and ulceration. They can be either acute or, or chronic, and they're, they're common in cold, damp and windy conditions. And I remember my, my mother mm -hmm. telling me that she had this as a, a child when she had to walk many miles to a train station every morning in the cold and then stand there waiting for the train to come. And cold urticaria is, is probably something not a lot of people have heard of, but it's essentially an allergic reaction to, to the cold. So with, with frostbite, there are basically three phases of, of treat, treatment. And um, that is what we do in the pre-hospital setting, what we do in the hospital setting, and um, what happens afterwards. Ideally, you should avoid thawing and protect from further harm until you can get someone to definitive care. I won't, uh, I won't run through this because we are, we are running a little bit short of time. Uh, apologies for the technical issues at the start, but uh, that will be in the um, slide pack for your, your reference. And um, imaging may, may or may not be, be helpful, but basic message is that you still need to wait three or four weeks to, to find out um, the final state of the um, underlying tissue. And there, there are some um, experimental treatments as well, 
but at this stage none of them have appeared to be more effective over um, rewarming. With, uh, with trench foot, once again, I'll, I'll leave this as a, um, a resource for you, but, uh, but basically uh, conservative management is best. They should be allowed to rewarm um, gradually. Uh, elevation is good because you can get edema and swelling and treating pain is important and also being on the lookout for any underlying uh, tissue necrosis. With, uh, with chill blains, the um, main management strategy is advising people to avoid being out in the cold, which might be easier said than done. So if they can't avoid that, at least have uh, appropriate insulated clothing and uh, smokers should be encouraged to quit because of the, um, the general influence of um, smoking on the vasculature. Uh, cold, cold urticaria is thought to be uh, one of the um, IgE type uh, reactions. It's a sub subtype of um, general urticaria, so you you get um, wheels on the skin, and um, you can get angioedema as well. The the symptoms are are usually just limited to the exposed areas, but um, but it can become systemic if uh, there's extensive cold contact and occasionally anaphylactic reactions do occur. And the underlying causes are, are largely unknown. The, uh, the management strategies, once, once again, uh, avoidance is important. Um, education about uh, what people's triggers are if, um, if somebody does have a tendency towards severe reactions or anaphylaxis, an um, epinephrine auto-injector is, uh, is a good idea. And also non-sedating antihistamines can be useful. And finally, uh, because I'm interested in space, just, just a, a few quick slides on the relevance to space exploration. So uh, space is a really interesting environment, which can be both both very hot and uh, very cold. But but when we say uh, very cold, we do do mean very cold. So if we're thinking about what what could go wrong and expose um, astronauts to to hypothermia or cold injuries. I guess it's it's quite similar things to what can happen on Earth if you if you don't have a sufficient level of protective clothing if your your clothing is not adequately sealed or, or secured there there was an example of an astronaut uh, who didn't have a glove which was properly secured which uh, did cause a little bit of grief at the time um, accidental damage from uh, space debris and if you've all seen the movie Gravity you can um, imagine how that could could occur. Uh, there's always going to be the potential for explosions where we have oxygen rich atmospheres, uh, traumatic injury, decompression incidents because uh, people go through a lot of airlocks and um, when you're out on the, the surface of another, another world, there'll always be the potential for vehicle accidents, just the same as here on Earth. And um, moisture can, can play a role and um, conductivity um, and um, contact between the suit and um, a cold, very cold uh, planetary surface. And of course, uh, we also have the human factor. Uh, there'll always be a risk of uh, poor judgment or, or risk taking. And um, polar and uh, mountain exploration is littered with examples of, of people who took one risk too, too many. And certainly hypothermia can play a role in that as, as the more severe it becomes, the more disorientated and confused people become. And uh, you've probably heard of the, the uh, paradoxical undressing where, where people who are severely hypothermic will actually start taking clothing off because they feel that they're hot. 
so that's that's the end um sorry to race through some of it a bit but the slide pack will will be available for you if um if there's anything that you would like to look at again so andrew uh, over to you for moderation of questions okay well we're now at the point of the presentation where we can have questions come in from the remote audience so if you'd like to ask a question directly to Dr. Christensen, um, you can use the uh, hand icon on the little GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll be able to unmute your microphone, and you can ask the question directly. If you'd like to send a question um, just by text uh, through the chat feature, um, we can do that as well, and I'll just read it out loud. So um, I know it's always a bit difficult being the first one to go, but um, no, no, no need to be shy or timid here. Um, so if anyone has some questions, please let me know by indicating that with the uh, hand icon or sending a question over through uh, the chat feature. So I did have a quick question just to uh, maybe educate me a little bit on the geography of Australia, where would be, what, what part of Australia is the mountainous region where you would have uh, the possibility of exposure to some extreme cold temperatures? Ah, that's, that's a very uh, good question and probably good good for people to know. We, we have a number of alpine areas uh, on the mainland. They go across the, the, the three eastern states of Victoria, um, New South Wales and also the Australian Capital Territory and uh, there are a number of uh, ski resorts in both Victoria and New South Wales in northern Victoria and um, uh, the ACT also has the Kosciuszko National Park which contains Mount uh, Kosciuszko which is our highest highest mountain so-called mountain uh, but it's only 2,200 metres high, so I'm sure some of the people listening will come from places where there are, there are far bigger mountains than that. And uh, also in Tasmania, there, there are, uh, I think, three, three designated uh, ski alpine areas, but there, there are also areas in the Tasmanian wilderness that, that do receive snow in winter and um, people, uh, some people do like to, to go into those areas uh, in winter for recreational activities. All right, so that was the icebreaker because now I have some people coming in with questions here. So, and no pun intended with the icebreaker uh, comment since it is on <laughs> cold extreme temperatures here and hypothermia. So the first question I have is, what is the evidence for effectiveness of intermittent CPR? It's um it's one of those those things that of course you can't do a randomized controlled trial. So it's really been experiential evidence from the um, the lead authors who who wrote that paper, and um, they uh, they I guess have developed this this concept and applied it over a number of of years in uh, both mainland Europe and and also in uh, the, the ski resorts which are are in England I think mainly in Scotland but they've they've tried these things out and then assessed um, the outcomes of the people afterwards and generally because hypothermia has a protective effect on on the brain the oxygen requirements are quite um, dramatically reduce the more hypothermic that, that you are. So from a physiological point of view, it, it actually um, makes, makes sense that you might be able to get away with um, using intermittent CPR. Whereas of, of course, if, if you're um, just in a, a normal warm environment, that that's something you wouldn't consider because I, I guess the figure often quoted is if the brain is without oxygen for uh, four minutes or 
more that you'll, you'll suffer, suffer irreversible brain damage. Okay, uh, got another question here. Uh, it says, what would be an example of gradual warming as opposed to rapid warming? Uh, and there's a second part to that. It says, is warm water better than using one's skin to warm someone's hand, for example? Um, okay, so so gradual rewarming. Uh, there there are two main concepts that that you see referred to in the literature. One one is passive external rewarming, which uh, which can also be referred to as gradual rewarming, and then um, active uh, rewarming, which which would generally be at the level of um, more aggressive hospital type measures. So grad gradual rewarming will, will include things like uh, trying to get somebody into uh, a warm environment, removing wet clothing. Uh, if you've got, got things like hot water bottles, uh, if you don't, uh, what you mentioned in terms of rewarming re someone's uh, skin using your your warm body, if that's not going to compromise your your own state, that can be an example of, of gradual or, or passive rewarming. And um, uh, warm warm water, uh, I guess, is used in some circumstances, but you certainly, uh, if if you're talking about just passive passive rewarming, would wouldn't be wanting that to be be hot water just um, sort of I guess comfortably comfortably warm water whereas hotter water can can have a role in um, thawing of, of frostbite but that's a little bit of a, a specialized category um, does that that answer the question Uh, well, I, I think so. Um, it just came in by um, the text feature, so um, we'll have to assume that is a sufficient response. Uh, so we do have a few other questions here. The next question is, what criteria do you, you use to refer an accidental hypothermic patient to an ECLS center, and in what time frame do you make such referrals when such patients present? I, I guess to answer that that question, the the best answer would be to go go back to the algorithm uh, from the Wilderness Medical Society. Um, but uh, I think certainly anybody that you've assessed as being hypothermic uh, and not able to to care for themselves should go to a hospital setting and anyone who's who's collapsed is unconscious with with hypothermia uh, will definitely need high high level critical care support as as I mentioned um, people with hypothermia who suffer cardiac arrest can require CPR for many hours while they're they're rewarmed and there are certainly many, uh, many examples of successful resuscitations after many hours. Uh, people with, with body temperatures down in the 20s, for instance, have been successfully resuscitated. But the, the time frame is always, if you believe that somebody needs hospital treatment, that they should be evacuated to the nearest centre which provides definitive care as soon as possible. If you're if you're on the side of a mountain, it's it's going to take you a bit of time to actually get the person off the mountain to a point where they can be, be lifted out for for instance. But always always our aim is as soon as possible. Okay, we have a Another question here from, well, it's a comment and a question from Dwight Robinson. Uh, Dwight says, thank you, Dr. Christensen. Great presentation. Has there been any recorded exposure related injuries in space? And then there's a second part to that uh, and says, is there any 
different man are there any different management principles in this type of environment uh, thank you that's that's a, a really interesting question the the only exposure incident that I'm aware of is the the one where an astronaut's glove became um, unscrewed and um, so there was there was that um, transient exposure to to the cold of of space but it's also the type of information that the space agencies are probably not going to um, give out as a, as a matter of um, uh, public policy that's probably the sort of thing they prefer to keep to themselves and I only got that bit of information from an insider. Uh, I, I think in that environment um, there, there are always going to be some challenges. The One of, one of the things that I guess we, we're first going to want, to want to try to do as with terrestrial hypothermia is to remove the person uh, away from the cold as soon as possible or if there's a breach in the suit to try to put something there to, to seal up the breach. But one, one of the big challenges for off-world exploration is that all space suits are going to be bulky to, to some extent, that they are self-contained life support systems and if, if, they, if they are breached, um, it might not always be possible to rescue someone in, um, in a timely manner. And also just um, the speed with which people can be rescued will to some extent be, be limited by the bulkiness of the, the suits and the speed with which the, the astronauts can move and um, how soon help can, can get to them. So I think planning for all of this is really important but um, but there's still a lot of work to be done all right we have a few more questions here um, so we have another question from Laura uh, Laura says how often do you give epinephrine in accidental hypothermia Uh, I, I guess the, the main time that, that I could imagine that we would give epinephrine is if we're, we're following the um, life support pro protocol and uh, giving it every second, second uh, cycle when we're, we're doing our CPR. And um, I haven't haven't heard of it being used for for hypothermia per se but i can certainly uh, see see that it could be used in a hypothermic casualty if you if you were following that standard life support protocol okay we're coming up to the top of the hour here uh looks like we have two questions left do you still have a few minutes rowena absolutely okay um, so I have a question here from Sarah Bestwick. Sarah says, in the recommendations given, it talked about a patient's chest becoming too stiff to perform CPR. Do you, do you perform warming before attempting to perform CPR? Uh, from, from the literature that, that I've read, a patient's chest being too stiff to perform CPR is, um, is one of the reasons that uh, you might decide not to perform CPR and might decide that that, that person is, um, is beyond saving. Um, so I guess it, it would always be up to the, the discretion of the, the rescuers. But um, I guess one, one of the challenges is if somebody's chest is, is frozen, it's going to take probably quite a long period of time to defrosted enough that you can get that that adequate five five to six centimeters of of compression and um, by the time you've done that it may be way way too long to be able to bring them back so I guess that's probably the, the main reason why they often say don't don't um, start CPR in in that particular circumstance <laughs> 
Okay, we have a question here from Yanni from Finland. Um, and Yanni says, and I hope I pronounced the name correctly, uh, what do your new guidelines say about hypothermia in combination with trauma? Uh, that, that, that can be quite a difficult um, situation, but I guess the, the two, two things that we would be aiming to do simultaneously would be to, to try to mitigate the effects of the, the hypothermia, but at the same time uh, treat the person's traumatic injuries because it's probably going to be the, the traumatic injuries that are a greater risk to, to life and limb than, than the hypothermia. Um, and uh, things things like if if somebody's um, has an amputated limb from from trauma, you're probably going to want to focus most of your your efforts on on stopping the the blood loss and trying to uh, stabilize them enough that you can actually evacuate them. And you you may only be able to do superficial things to address the, the hypothermia and it will also depend on how many people you have available to to help but but certainly uh, we we would prioritize trying to to do things that will save the person's life over um, going into a sort of detailed um, uh, going through of the sort of things that that might make them feel a bit more more comfortable Okay, well, I think that just about wraps things up. Um, oh, we have one follow-up question here. Um, it's referring back to the uh, epinephrine doses. Um, and I'm going to try and paraphrase this there. Uh, but Laura's saying that for clarification of my previous question, uh, she says AHA is kind of vague on frequency of epinephrine doses and CPR and at what temperature defibrillation should be used under arrest situations. Um, any thoughts on that, Dr. Christensen? So uh, I, I can only speak about the, the algorithm that we use here in Australia, but uh, we give epinephrine or adrenaline, as it's sometimes called here, every, every second cycle uh, of, of CPR. So um, every, um, and uh, sort of building, building in um, defibrillation checks into that, that is, as well, and it's one one milligram of um, epinephrine that's that's recommended here. And sorry, Andrew, I didn't quite catch the second part of the question. Um, you know, I'm going to try something here. If you're listening, Laura, I can unmute your microphone and you can ask the question uh, directly. Um, that might be easier than me trying to um, paraphrase your question. So she might not still be listening, but let's give it a try. Are you there, Laura? Yeah, I'm here. So it, the 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 issue is is that AHA sort of is when they put out their their last set of guidelines, they were saying that there was concern about epinephrine building up if you give it too often, and they were suggesting perhaps going down to a 10 minute thing um, in terms of not necessarily cycles, but but every 10 minutes consider giving epi, and then there was this um, statement to try sort of three shocks initially on presentation and then um, hold off on trying to defibrillate somebody even if they're in VF until you have them a bit warmer. And I, I don't know what your experiences are around these because they're, they're kind of, they're not as directive. Obviously we don't see these situations hopefully quite as often as uh, as you know, the regular arrest, but it's just, it's hard to know when to actually start shocking somebody again and, and how warm is warm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I understand uh, now. So um, 
so so yes um certainly where where somebody is is very very cold uh the cardiac ma muscle might not uh, respond in a positive way to to being shocked so it is it is reasonable when somebody is is still a long way from normal normothermic temperature to hold off on on shocking them and um, continue with with CPR and um, and uh, I I'm afraid I haven't uh, seen anything specifically on um, changing the dosing of of epinephrine in these these situations, but um, but I guess uh, once once again, given uh, that the the effect that you're you're aiming for may may only work properly in um, a sort of stable cardiovascular system or sort of more um, thermically stable system. Um, then I guess if somebody is very cold, it, it probably also would be reasonable to hold off um, for a little while with that as well and, until, until perhaps you start to see some of the hypothermic changes in the ECG starting to resolve and you might feel at that point that, that it might be worth, um, worth trying a, a shock um, I'm I'm not not haven't uh, read about the idea of giving stack stack shocks first first up, um, so so I'm sorry our our guidelines uh, aren't quite as detailed when it comes to that side of things, but I've I've certainly read about um, read about those ideas in guidelines that are published by overseas organisations and. The the AHA is one of them, of course, but um, but in general, you're going to want the the cardiac muscle to be stable enough temperature-wise that um, that it's going to have a chance to respond to either being shocked or the administration of, of epinephrine and the effect that 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 is going to have on the sympathetic nervous system. So, so sorry, I can't can't really give you a better answer than that. 